fellowship. We're not trying to be a large Southwide fellowship. We're not trying to do that, but we want to do what God wants us to do. Amen. And uh, we just want to see God work in our midst. Uh, so we're not trying to be big. We're trying to minister. That's our idea is minister to people. So I appreciate again, uh, the, the church here, a Bible Baptist church opening their doors. And this time I'm going to turn it back over to pastor Stevens Stevenson. I uh, gotta get that correct, and uh, he'll have the introduce the singing, and then the first speaker. Appreciate it. Brother Yoder is no stranger to us. We greatly appreciate his work with the fellowship. I know I've also appreciated his ministry. So in just a moment, he'll be coming to speak with us, speak for us. But before he does, I believe his daughters are going to come and give us a special. <laughs> The Lord said to Moses, set my people free, for I have heard their groanings and their cryings unto me. But Moses said they would not believe, nor hearken unto me. Take the rod that is in your hand and lay it at my feet and cast it on the ground. See what I can do. Learn what a little 
All right. Thank you, Orleans. Good job with that. I appreciate being able to have the opportunity to preach here this morning. Um, I thank you, Brother Stevenson, for asking me to preach. Um, I, I, it, is, it is a blessing to be able to preach, amen. amen. It's hard, I will say, to preach in front of old preachers, <laughs> especially the old, old ones like Brother Otis. <clears throat> you... Uh, you, uh, uh, you've studied the Word of God much longer than I have been. I'm only 40 years old, and you've probably been studying the Word of God for 40 years. And, uh, and so I, I don't think I'm going to be bringing anything necessarily new to your attention, but uh, maybe it might be a reminder to you, an encouragement for you, and that's what I would want to be today, all right? John chapter 11, John chapter 11, familiar passage. If we would be honest, there's been times when we prayed, perhaps earnestly prayed, and God didn't answer our prayer. Maybe we were expecting a yes, maybe we were expecting a no, we didn't even get a maybe. Maybe we prayed for a certain outcome. And it didn't happen. We prayed for revival. We scheduled a revival, had great preaching. But there was no response from the church. And uh, we, we, we may be faithfully serving. And then something happens. We, we, we uh, get stabbed in the back from another church member. Or a trial comes and hits us. And, and we, we, we are in a difficulty. Do we respond like Job? And, and as he responded in Job chapter 1? Or do we respond to look up to heaven and we say, God, where is God in this? How is this good? This is where John chapter 11, you know the story. John chapter 11, where Lazarus is, is sick and dies. I'm going to explore this story where Jesus says one thing, and it's misinterpreted to be another. Good news was given only to have their faith shattered and be left in doubt of what would happen. Now, this is not the only story uh, that I could, that I could uh, bring up as this example. You know the story of the uh, Syrophoenician woman, Matthew chapter 15, where she had a daughter that was, uh, was, was in, in difficulty. She, was, uh, um, she had a demon possession, and uh, she prayed in earnest to, and came to Jesus and asked in earnest, please help me. And God, Jesus Christ called her a dog. You remember that? He said, he, he, I, I, don't ha I'm not gonna, I didn't come here for the dogs. And it stretched her faith. And she continued to pursue Jesus even after that. And in Matthew chapter 8, <clears throat> you know the story about Jesus Christ is, is going through town. And, and two blind men yell out, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And the next passage of the, of the verses, it shows that Jesus went into the house. Totally disregarded them. Didn't, he didn't, didn't give them any attention. He went on into the house, left them outside. And they come to the door. Jesus, we need you. And they're praying for Jesus. And he disregarded them. He opened the door, but I will let you know that both these people, the woman and the blind men, had their answers met. They, their needs met by Jesus Christ. They, their faith, though... Their faith was stretched to the very end. It was, it was a, a thread thickness. It was so stretched that, uh, boy, other people would have probably gotten mad. What kind of Jesus is this? I thought he was going to come and help us. I thought he was going to do some great miracle. You know, Herod wanted that. He wanted to see Jesus do some magic trick. The different type of Jesus uh, that, that uh, they were expecting, perhaps, but... Uh, this story here in John chapter 11, let's, let's read the passage. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany in the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Verse 3. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, 
but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith his disciples, let us go into Judea again. Can I describe the story a little bit and, and uh, set the stage? I, I like to, to put emotions into the characters in Scripture. It, it really, come, the, the Bible comes alive when we put personalities with people. Mary and Martha, it, we know their, their, their tendencies of their personalities, and that Mary and Martha are in a, in a terrible strait. And, and here Lazarus is sick. He's like any average man who doesn't go to the hospital till the last second. And uh, I don't know if your wife has ever been uh, so concerned for you in those times, but, uh, but here Lazarus stays at, at home. He refuses to go to the hospital and get help. And, uh, and, and, and Mary and Martha are, are very concerned for his health. And they see that, boy, he is just not going to make it. There's only one person who can help him, who they've known has healed so many people. They send servants, or send messengers, I should say, send messengers to get Jesus. They have to travel somewhere around 15 to 20 miles in search of Jesus. Jesus is on the other side of, of uh, the Jordan, beyond the Jordan, is what it says in the previous passage, where he was baptized. And the distance there was somewhere around 15 to 20 miles, if they didn't have to run too much extra in search of Jesus. Jesus is, is there ministering to people, as he always is, and, and the messengers come up and say, Mary and Martha sent us. Lord, the man whom thou lovest, he's sick. They need you. They, they need you to come. And the servants, what do the servants hear Jesus Christ say? This sickness is not nigh unto death. That's what the servants hear. This sickness is not nigh unto death. What a joy. What a joy for the servants. And they're able to run back home to Mary and Martha. And I, I don't, I, I'm not uh, ruining the plot of the story because you know it well. They run back and by the time they get there, they've uh, probably the day when they were looking for Jesus, Lazarus dies. Because that's day number one. While they were in pursuit of Jesus. And they run back, open the doors and say, Jesus says Lazarus won't die. And here's Lazarus in the side of the room. Preparing to be buried. Mary and Martha are in distress. The servants now heard Jesus say, This sickness is not unto death, that Lazarus won't die. Mary and Martha sent the messengers and said, Lord, the man whom thou lovest, that love, there's three loves in the Bible. If you've done study on that, I'm sure. There's three loves in the Bible. Primarily two are used, agape love and filial love. And this filius love is what is mentioned here. Lord, the man who loves you, he's your friend. That filios love is that friendship, that close bond that you have with a best friend. This man who is a friend of you, he loves you. He needs you. He's sick nigh unto death. He, he needs you to come in. Now, Jesus Christ has a different type love that is mentioned in verse 5. Watch how he describes his love. He says, Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. That love there is an agape love. An agape love is a, is a, is a different type of love. It's more than a friendship. It's a, it's a love that we as husbands are to have toward our wife. It's an agape love that you love them expecting nothing in return. You love your people in your church expecting nothing in return. Somebody here despises you. Somebody here mistreated you. And you still have an agape love towards them and want what's best for them. You, 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 you have someone else that hurt you emotionally or hurt your family. You have an agape love towards them. We as pastors are to love the church. The, the wife is not commanded to love the husband with an agape love. This is not Valentine's Day. I'm just bringing this out here, okay? Uh, the, the wife is supposed to have a filios type love, that best friend, that love, that respect for their head. The older women in the church, 
I'm not going to point any who's, who's the older women in the church, but the older women in the church are to teach the younger women to love, to phileos their husband. It's interesting that Martha, in sending the messenger, she said, the one that loves you, the one that you love, your best friend, according to Martha, he's your best friend. But Jesus Christ's response was that he, I love him. The servants might have heard that as well, where his love was much more than what Lazarus had for Jesus Christ. And this type, I, I need to look, you understand that Jesus is for us. And we go through difficulties in our life and, and uh, trials in our life, but Jesus is for us. Sometimes we need a reminding of that. The devil, you know how the devil works and tries to get us to doubt and trip us up. Amen. But we ought to have a love for the Lord Jesus Christ as he loves us. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know there's certainty there. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love him. That's that agape love who love Jesus Christ. Even if we go through a difficulty and, and an unanswered prayer, even if we feel that there's disappointment with Jesus towards us, we're disappointed with what he's not doing in our church, in our life, in our family. We're, we're, we're left and we, we feel we're alone. We have disappointment there. But understand that we have a love for him. Maybe, maybe perhaps we get into uh, in, in the day where persecution may come. Listen, we ought to be just like Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And this is where, this is where Mary and Martha and the servants, they saw Jesus and answer their prayer. And Lazarus isn't going to die. And now they're in a tailspin. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I'm disappointed in Jesus. Now let's look at Jesus' response. What does he say in verse 15? And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. What? I am glad for your sakes that I was not there? I thought you loved Mary and Martha. What does Mary and Martha think about this? How, how are they in deep emotional distress during this time? And Jesus says, I'm glad. Our friend Lazarus, he's just sleeping. He's just sleeping. Now, I love, this is just a side note. Quickly, I'll say, I love in the New Testament, when, when the New Testament talks about the Christians who've passed on, it refers to them as sleeping, right? The New Testament Christian is not someone who's dead. They're just sleeping, waiting to be risen up again. Amen. And, and we, they're, they're not gone. We don't lose the Christian uh, family member. We don't lose the Christian friend. Because they're, if you put $100 in the bank, you didn't lose the $100, did you? You put it in the bank. We don't lose the friend or family member that's trusted in Jesus Christ. They're just in the bank of heaven. We know exactly where they are. Amen. So this is, this is Jesus Christ is, is uh, telling his disciples that Lazarus is sleeping. And of course, they didn't understand what he was talking about. So he had to come into their level and, and their reasoning and, and just say plainly, hey, Lazarus is dead, okay? Wait a minute. You said that he wasn't going to die, that sickness wasn't unto death. They heard it too. And now the disciples were staying there for two days with Jesus and continuing to minister. You can understand the urgency with Martha wanting Jesus to come. You know, Jesus, those people that you're ministering to, they're strangers. We know that there's a need there, but your friend is over here and he needs you more. And uh, the disciples were not in a hurry because Lazarus is going to be fine. Of course, they weren't in a hurry either because remember in the previous chapter, Jesus was about to be stoned to death. And, and, and uh, uh, Thomas's faith was at a high level here versus when it was after Jesus Christ died on the cross and, and he rose again. Thomas's faith was, was high here where he said, He's going to Jerusalem. That's only two, less than two miles away. Uh, we're going to be in Bethany. And that's only less than two miles away from Jerusalem. They're probably going to find us. Let us go with Jesus that we may die with him. I'm willing to die if Jesus gets 
stoned, most likely going to come for us as well. So I'm willing to die along with Jesus. That was Thomas, what we call Doubting Thomas, or who we call Doubting Thomas. But Jesus' outlook was glad. Did you ever think that your trial is meant more for someone else, perhaps, than for you? Now, it helps us because as, as Psalms 139, the latter part, and, and try our, our hearts and see if there be any wicked way within us, right? And so it helps us to know where we are in our faith, but, but also our trials are for others. Perhaps God gave you that trial because that Christian over there would not have lasted he couldn't have gone through that. Maybe bitterness would have built in their heart, but they see you going through the difficulty, see you going through the, through the turmoil and the trial, and then they see, well, if they can go through it, I can too. In fact, this past week, we were at the church camp and took some teenagers to church camp. And I, I brought a teenager here uh, that uh, just, just came with us. What happened to you this past week? He got saved, Amen. He's only one of two that we had. Uh, 30 teenagers got saved. I just uh, had a, a text this morning that uh, another one uh, at home got worked on over the phone, and, and they, they uh, uh, led her to Christ over the phone. So that brings the tally to 30 teenagers got saved as a result of last week. So uh, there was one uh, person that went up and gave a testimony. Uh, one of the singing group from Heartland was there. She gave a testimony. She came from a broken home. Mom's a drug addict. Dad left the family. Soon after, she's taken out of the home. And this young lady who, who looks like she's raised in church, she's in modest clothing. She has a good attitude. She, she uh, is very graceful. She's very ladylike. She had, was put into foster care and was very bitter as a young child, young teenager. And then a pastor adopted her out of foster care, raised her up and got a hold of her heart. And, and uh, she's in, in a, a, godly, a godly college today and, and going around. Listen, here's what my teenager said to me as she gave her testimony. He got saved that night and he said, if God can do that for her. He can do that for me. Amen. So sometimes your trial is, may not only be for you. That's right. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Right. We know that uh, we, we have to accept the sorrows sometimes and understand what 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort, Amen. who comforteth us yes. in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them who are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Amen. We go through a sorrow and we pray and ask God for healing for our family member. We ask God for healing and the answer doesn't come or the way we expect it. We lose a son, or we lose a daughter, or we lose a parent, and, and we lose a faithful church member, or, or some trial comes in our life, and we're, we're blindsided, and it just, it just happened out of the blue, and, and we search for God, and, and try and find, where is God in this? And we go through passages in, in Scripture, and we, we find the verses that help us. We find, find the passages of Scripture that help us, and by God's grace, we get through the trial. Lo and behold, two or three... Five years later, someone else who's going through the same thing. And you go over here, brother, I know exactly what you're going through. I've been through it. I've been hit on the side of the head with life. And you're, in a, you're, in, you're dizzy. You're confused. Here's some verses that helped me out. Here's something that I can help you with. We comfort them by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Jesus' outlook was glad on the situation. We have to see things from God's perspective. What can be done in a greater way than what 
we would actually limit things. Martha, I mean, let me go quickly. Martha heard Jesus was coming and went out and waited for him. And what was her first statement to Jesus when, she, when Jesus Christ came to where she was? What was her first statement in verse 21? Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. It's almost that, Lord, it's your fault. Lord, where were you at? I needed you, and you didn't answer my prayer. You didn't show up. <clears throat> Martha said all she knew, though. I love it. I love it. There was, you know, if you've been in situations, you know what it's like to where you get in such a dark place where you read your Bible and it just doesn't make sense. You pray and you look like Job to your right and to your left and you don't see God anywhere. And, and there's just a, a cloud around you as, as far as confusion goes in those dark, difficult hours. And here Mary, uh, Martha was being taught by Jesus Christ that I am the resurrection. I am the life. Yes. Martha doesn't get everything. She doesn't grab a hold of it. All she does is grab on to what she knows. Here's what she knows in verse 21. I'm sorry, verse 27. Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. I don't know anything else, but I know that much. And I still believe in you. I still have faith in you. I don't have time to go to the other examples that uh, have that as well. Uh, John chapter 16, verse 30, the disciples basically did the same thing in their confusion. Mark chapter 9, verse 24, remember the de desperate father whose son was, was uh, falling into the fire and falling into the water, and the father went in and grabbed him and helped him out so many times, and, and he, he, he was disappointed with the disciples, and Jesus didn't have an urgency that the father wanted. And the father said, uh, he, he said Jesus Christ said, Do you believe that I can do this? And he said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Stretch to the very last thread of his faith. Mary's faith was exhausted as well. She didn't meet Jesus like Martha did. Martha was always at the, at the place where she would talk to Jesus. Mary was always at the feet of Jesus. You always see her coming at the feet of Jesus. Jesus asked, hey, where's Mary? Now, there's two sisters. Where's Mary? And so Martha runs back and gets Mary, and, and Mary recognizes, hey, Jesus is waiting on me. So Mary runs to where Jesus is and falls at his feet. And what's her first response? Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. She's the same response as Martha. Disappointment, discouragement, confusion. It's easy to say, well, bless God, Jesus came right on time. Well, listen, they were, they were in a difficulty. They, they were in this dark hour. And you know what it's like to be in trouble and needing, needing an answer, needing God to show up in some way. Their faith was tested, just like ours. Jesus was meeting with other people in, in verse 6. It was two days. Jesus was healing other people. He was building other people. And all Martha and, and, and Mary were over here waiting for Jesus to come. Any minute, he's going to come down the road. Any minute. The second day goes in. He's not there. Okay, he'll be here tomorrow morning. He'll be here early tomorrow morning. And that doesn't have third day have. And, and finally, he comes the fourth day just casually walking down the road. Where were you at? Jesus was ministering elsewhere to other people who needed him. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we, we look at other churches and say, God, you're working over here. God, people are getting saved at that church. What's happening here? And, this, and they're concerned. At, uh, we can get concerned of what uh, God may be doing elsewhere, and, and we need the Lord here. And if we're not careful, we'll get disappointed. Point number one was when we need Jesus and Jesus doesn't come. Point number two, and these next two points are brief, when Jesus needs us and we don't come. When Jesus needs us and we don't come. We could study all of the, Hebrew, of the other thousands of other Hebrew boys that went with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They went with Daniel into Babylon. What happened to all these other boys and their faith? There was only four that stood up. 
for what was right in, in another country of Babylon. Though God, God called them to be separate, sanctified, holy, they didn't answer that call. We could study Jonah when he was called and ran away from God. We could study the rich young ruler who was confronted by Jesus Christ himself about the rich young ruler's God, who his real God was. The rich young ruler came as, I mean, as he looked like a good Christian. He was a good, moral human being. He helped poor people with his wealth. He was looked up to as a good, upstanding citizen. Jesus Christ pinpointed his problem. Your God is not me. Your God is your money. Yeah. Jesus Christ called him to give, that, give your wealth away and follow me. And you would have treasures in heaven. What did he say? He walked away sorrowful. Jesus needs us and we didn't come. In his case, we could study those disciples that left Jesus in John chapter 6 and said, this is a hard saying. Who can know it? And they left Jesus and would not follow him anymore. We could study those who gave an excuse why they wouldn't come to the marriage supper. The great supper. They, they gave excuses after excuses why they couldn't come. And how often do we make excuses why, Lord, we, we just can't do, we, we can't witness to that person today. We can't, we can't, I can't talk to that person today. We'll have to do it later. And we make excuses on our own. How often does the Holy Spirit prick us to share the gospel and we run like Jonah? How often does the Holy Spirit prick us to, to call a brother or sister in Christ that may need some encouragement and, and we just put it off and end up not doing it at all? Or to, to, to come to the feeding trough in the morning and, and read our Bible or in the evening whenever you do it, and read our Bible and have our time of prayer and we make excuse and why it's just not, I, I just can't do it, I'm too busy today. Or how often does the Holy Spirit prick our hearts to make things right with that brother or sister in Christ in the church? Our, our wife or our husband, our children. We just push the Lord aside and that relationship is still divided. But Jesus needs to come when I call. We, we get who's... We get mixed up with who's the servant. Point number three is, is brief. When Jesus called the dead, he came. When Jesus called the dead man, he came. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. You know the story in, the, in Romans chapter 5. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the, uh, it mentions about grace, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What does the Bible say? God forbid! How shall we continue therein? How, how shall we that are dead to sin continue therein? We're dead to sin. We're, we're supposed to be uh, uh, dead to anything of this uh, world's uh, attraction, right? Romans chapter 12, verses 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Sometimes the living sacrifices tend to crawl off the altar. We're a living sacrifice. We're dead to the, to the peer pressures or the attractions of this world. That's how we're to be. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, I die monthly. I die annually, every Christmas and Easter. I die daily. Yeah. It's a daily effort to, to get the Lord's help. Lord, I need you to help me. To die to self so I could be filled with the Holy Spirit. It took a dead man's obedience to respond to Jesus. It took a dead man's obedience to preach the deity of Jesus. Can, can you imagine the, the, this man, this, this, what many people saw as an ordinary man, sees him call forth the dead and he comes? He must be of God. There's no question. And so the dead man's obedience was preaching the deity of Jesus Christ. It took a dead man's obedience to proclaim the power of Jesus. It took a dead man's obedience to point the lost to Jesus. 
Lazarus didn't have any ability or power on his own. He had to fully rely on the power of Jesus Christ. That which is what was granted by Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11 says, if any, man, uh, if, if any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. Through the power of the word of God, speak as of the oracles of God. If any man may minister, let him do it with what authority? Let him do it with the ability which God giveth. That God, that God, not us, that God, not this preacher, that God in all things may be glorified, to whom be power and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He deserves the credit. He deserves the praise. Perhaps feeding the sheep sometimes becomes a little monotonous. Not every day do you chase away the wolves. Not every day do you birth a lamb. But every day, on the farm... You put out the oats, you feed the sheep, you're faithful to feed the sheep. That's what we're commanded to do, right? Acts 20, 28. Feed the flock of God. It's amazing how God can use us in spite of ourselves. How God can use sinful men to reach sinful men. Sometimes it seems that if we allow the devil to attack us and believe his lies, that Jesus comes across as disappointing. How often do we fail him daily? He is faithful and just.